So hi there and welcome to this Bloodborne lore series where I will be discussing the story of Bloodborne which may be more difficult to understand than the other Soul series for some people because a lot of it is based on conjecture and symbolism. However I will do my best to interpret the information as I see it and in this episode I will be looking at the overall story. Therefore I will be looking at the Hunters, the Knight of the Hunt, the Healing Church, the Great Ones and the Dream, the Hunter's Dream. I could easily go on a lot more depth of these subjects but to give you an idea for the plot I will keep them relatively short but as you see I actually go into quite a bit of detail. So with all that said, let us begin our journey into the world of Bloodborne. We are an outsider seeking pale blood, and then we become a hunter by receiving blood ministration of what we are told is yarn and blood, and then we sign a contract. Note that we clearly know about pale blood previous to our coming to Yarnum, for the dialogue between the man at the beginning suggests that we are asking him about pale blood. The wheelchair man I have a theory on who or what this person might be associated with, but I'll tell you that later. He tells us that we may consider what happens next, a dream. Consider. Uh, I will discuss soon that dreams really aren't what they are in the normal world, but rather separate planes of reality. The dream shows us a beast rising from the blood before exploding into flame. More than likely, symbolic of the beast which rages within, within all men, especially hunters, for their beast roar item suggests that beasts are already present within men. When we awake, we find a note telling us to seek pale blood to transcend the hunt. I'll discuss pale blood and why we are looking for it and what the hunter's dream is at the end of this video because that is more likely my conclusion. The messengers then swarm around us and we black out. The next time we awake, we find ourselves bound to another reality known as the Hunter's Dream. We also have a rune etched in our mind, the rune that reads Hunter, and it is these two facts that makes us a true hunter. A full moon hangs in the sky, both here in the Hunter's Dream and in Yarnum, and I will later discuss the significance of the full moon. This is the first time when we meet Gar German, who tells us, quite flippantly, that hunters hunt beasts and that you should do this. However, as you learn during the course of the game, as German has, that the purpose of a true hunter is far more complicated than that. There are many different types of hunter uh, in the game. There are the ones like us that are linked to the dream and marked by the room. The game makes great efforts to stress that there are official church hunters, which are separate from the regular hunters, who and these hunters operate under the auspices of the healing church. If we look at Ludwig's Holy, Holy Blade and the Sword Hunter's Badge, it tells us that Ludwig was the first of these official church hunters. But I'll talk more detail about the church in a bit. Whatever their earthly affiliation, all real hunters are marked by the rune and linked to the dream. The uniform of the executioners, a paramilitary wing of the church hunters, if they are official hunters or not, they clearly do believe in the church, for they are opposed to the vile bloods who are opposed to the church. Anyway, the executioners have the hunter's mark on their actual gear, if you notice that. Not only this, we know that church hunters were, at least at some point, true hunters, because the messengers accept the healing church badges, recognising their worth and providing you with gear, which again suggests that they were true hunters. German also tells us that in the time of Ludwig, the church were the guardians of the hunters, but the blood ministers, who are the people of the church, don't even remember them now. I'm sorry about my pronunciation of Ludwig. <laughs> Then there are fake hunters, who are hunters in name only, and these represent the first simple enemies that we fight in the game. Uh, the description of the wooden shield tells us that these are simply Yarnamites who have risen to join the hunt. German is the first hunter, so we know that there have been many hunters, and in addition, many hunts. 
His equipment tells us that he created his equipment before the workshop even existed and modified simple equipment. And I postulate that this was even before the hunter's dream, so he was literally just a hunter in name only, albeit probably a very skilled one. And his equipment formed the basis of all future hunter attire. We know that the healing church workshop and the church hunter's equipment eventually departed from old garments techniques, and we learn this from Ludwig's holy breed. Not only this, but the church workshop weapons are designed to face more than just beasts, possibly otherworldly enemies. The reason that these church hunters might expect to face such creatures will be explained later, but just note that the church seems to know more about the Night of the Hunt than they let on to the public. Below the church workshop, um, we find the old workshop, which is the source of the hunter's dream. Uh, we know this just from the trophy that you get from it, but it's also very self-explanatory since it is an identical replication of the hunter's dream. Or rather, the dream's a replication of the old workshop. Uh, this suggests that German was possibly affiliated with the church rather than being an official hunter, but possibly just worked with them. Uh, we know that from the old hunter bone that he had many apprentices. Maybe these were the first of the official church hunters. They at one point departed from Garmin, however. Either way, the old workshop is abandoned and is now populated in the hunter's dream rather than in reality, in inverted commas. The nature of the hunter's dream is what I'll end on because it's there's forces at work here which are far beyond the ken of man and they actually drive the whole story when you stop and think about it. The Uden Chapel Samaritan uh, confirms the fact that there's been many hunts. Uh, he states the fact that this night is long, but it will end as it always has and it always will. Uh, therefore, the fact that there has been many and he himself has actually witnessed a few. Garmin also tells us that this night will be a long one, confirming that this is unusual light, but it is one of many. Uh, not only this, but a note found in the canal residence uh, uses the past tense when referring to the healing church abandoning old Yernum when it burned to the ground. But this leads us to the question, what is the Night of the Hunt? Very good question indeed. We know that there is a link between the Night of the Hunt and the Moon, as well as blood ministration. A note in old Yarnum tells us that the Moon hangs low and beasts roam the streets, and as indeed the Moon gets closer, the nightmare gets far worse. People lose their sanity and become more like beasts. I will further comment on the Eltrich nature, uh, nature of the moon later on, uh, but for now note that the full moon is clearly an indicator of the night of the hunt. Uh, I will look at the etymology of the school of Menses in order to explain this, um, but I'll examine the actual nature of the church, uh, the nature of the school uh, in the later part of this video. The word Menses is a derivation of the word menstruation. Uh, the word menses is actually a Latin word which means month, but it's also related to the Greek uh, word for moon. This, along with the moon and baby, baby imagery, suggests themes about cycle, both lunar and menstrual cycles. The fact that the school of menses perform their ceremonies at this time in the moon's cycle, uh, because the game itself suggests that the moon is an eldritch force, which marks the point of the month when the veil between our world and the next, or the cosmos, is weakest. Uh, this is obviously um, my interpretation of the context, but the fact that the school of Mensa seems to be obsessed with the moon, and the full moon is hanging low in the sky, and cycles are a big theme, it does make sense that the full moon uh, is the night of the hunt, essentially. So once a month, if months work the same in this game. Anyway, uh, sorry, I'll carry on now. A note found in Bergenworth more or less tells us this. It states, When the red moon hangs low, the line between beast and man is blurred, and when the great ones descend, a womb will be blessed with a child. Clearly, these are the nights of the hunt. Uh, Garmin is fond of reminding us that this will be a long night because the moon is especially low, and therefore the veil is especially thin. This is due to the meddling of the school of Menses, who have beckoned the moon close, but I'll deal with the precise nature of these rituals later. Just note that the reason that the moon is so low and the night is so long 
is because of the meddling of the school of Mensis and therefore the healing church. The moon is certainly the main cause, but it isn't the only link. Uh, blood ministration and the beast plague are two of the other main themes in the story, and these are all intrinsically linked. I believe them to be anyway. Although the hunter's moon no doubt accelerates the effect of the plague, the beasts are prima facie, that means on the face of it, the need for the hunters to hunt beasts. And these are the result of the so-called ash and blood ailment. We learn this from the antidote description. And this is the illness that then goes on to trigger the widespread beast plague, which once happened in Old Yarnum, and why that was why it was burnt to the ground. I believe that the use of the blood is the cause, along with the moon, and this is the cause for the beast plague. A couple of reasons that I've come to this conclusion. Firstly, we know that previous civilizations have been affected by the beastly scourge, who, much like the Yarnamites, undertook medical experiments, namely Lauren. The lower Lauren chalice tells us there are trace remains of medical procedures in parts of ailing Lauren. Whether these were attempts to control the scourge or the cause of the outbreak is unknown, and this ambiguity runs through the entire mandate of the church, them using blood ministration to me it comes across as if it's not clear whether this is the cure or the cause bit of both really and it's circular this shows us that the scourge has been around for a while and the Lauren's medical procedures were inseparable from the cause of the scourge Aileen is a hunter of hunters who hunts down blood adult hunters who have lost their minds because of their blood addiction much like seeking eldritch power, the use of blood is a source of power. We use the blood to get echoes and therefore to power up and to heal ourselves. As a result, some have become too addicted to blood and become much like the beast they hunt. Indeed, Gascoigne, who has become blood adult, physically turns into a beast. Uh, there's a hidden sort of covenant, uh, I learned this from a German spies channel, um, that if you invade a lot of other players without being a part of a covenant, you become a blood adult hunter, in inverted commas, and the hunters of hunters will automatically become your enemies. Jura also tells us that if you, when you enter Old Yarnum, he comments upon the fact that best hunters, like yourself, are half cut on blood. For, you, for those who don't know that colloquialism, it uh, basically refers to being half drunk or intoxicated if you used it in the real world. This not only highlights the alcohol-like qualities and addictive qualities of blood, but the hunter's reliance upon it. Not only this, but when you use a visceral attack, you see evidence of the beast within you. Uh, your hand changes into an almost claw-like instrument, and you rip into your prey. We start our journey with an initial ministration of blood. The blood vials tell us that the successive ministrations recall the first are more invigorating for it. In this universe, blood is analogous to alcohol in that it is intoxicating and addicting, and produced in vast quantities. We find this in the descriptions of the blood vial and the pungent blo blood cocktail. Yeah, try saying that when you're addicted to blood. The healing properties of blood are controlled and exerted by the healing church. And therefore, to understand the story and what blood has to play in the story, we'll now look at the church and its healing bloods. When we arrive, Gilbert helpfully tells us that the source of the church's healing blood lies within the Grand Cathedral. We hear more about this from Alfred, who tells us that students from Bergamorth once found a holy medium in the labyrinth which exists below Yarnum. And this medium led to the blood healing and the foundation of the church. The labyrinth is the old realm of the Thumerians, superhuman beings, who once uncovered the Eldritch truth. And we learn this from the Thumerian chalices in general. The Thumerians deserve a video in their own right, but for now just consider that they are beyond human. They had a close contact with the Great Ones, and at one point even acted as their guardians and the labyrinth is their old realm. On a brief design note, uh, the Thermarian design draws heavily from the painting by Edward Munch known as The Scream. Uh, many scholars believe that this inhuman scene, scream in the scene depicts someone who is losing their sense of self and losing contact with the world around them. 
Uh, this is also kind of a theme in Bloodborne, so it's no wonder the Fumerians look like this. This is possibly as a result of their eldritch knowledge insight, which has changed them forever. Anyway, as Alfred tells us, Bergenworth is an old place of learning, overseen by a man called Provost William. Willem, sorry. I believe that Bergenworth was a place of history and archaeology, and it is these disciplines that led to the scholars exploring the labyrinth and learning about the old ones and the old blood. The old ones, the great ones, sorry. The reason I believe that this is the case is because of the lecture key. This tells us today the two-story lecture building is adrift in the nightmare, but once it was a place of reflection where scholars learned of history and archaeology. The lecture theatre did not used to be adrift. It was not adrift. It was solid somewhere before. It makes sense that it is part of the Learning Institute at Bergenworth, firstly because it's the only learning institute we know of in the game, and we find a Bergenworth scholar's uniform here. This explains why they would have expeditions into the labyrinth, and therefore setting in motion all of the events in the game. We know that Willem sought the advancement of man through Eldritch Enlightenment. For one of the third of Umbilical Cord tells us, Provost William sought the cord in order to elevate his being and thoughts to that of a great one, by lining his mind with eyes. As well as the Great One's wisdom, which quotes a line of Willem's, who suggests that in order to ascend, one must gain more eyes. And in the game, this is represented by insight, literally lining your mind with eyes. However, Willem did not approve of gaining power through this old blood medium, which the students found in the labyrinth. We know this because the Rune Workshop tool, which is the work of Carol, a student of Bergenworth, states that Provost William would have approved of these runes because they do not rely upon blood in any measure. Despite his misgivings, one of his students, probably more, sought to use the blood for inverted commas good. I believe that Lawrence, when I discuss him in a minute, was actually using blood for good intentions, but the church is parted ways. And we witness this parting after examining the skull in the Grand Cathedral, uh, probably a memory. We see one of his students, Lawrence, parting ways with his old master, Willem, presumably to use the holy medium to find the church. Provost William warns him to fear the old bloods, by the god fear it. Warning Lawrence that using blood is not the way to ascension, and in fact will lead to disaster. Lawrence promises he will not forget the adage, which means the quip, fear the old blood. He won't forget that. If this is the skull of Lawrence, which probably is because it looks like we're examining a memory, then it would seem he too became a beast. You just need to look at the skull. Bergamoth scholars who diverged from their provost were the founders of the Healing Church, and we feel their influence in every part of the journey. We learn from Gilbert at the beginning of the game that they are in charge of blood ministration in Yarnum, and this is one of their main sources of control. As far as religious iconography and worship goes, they seem to venerate the old ones as gods. The old ones. Demon souls. Great, so the great ones as gods. And we see images of Amygdala, or his kin, in the chapel of Yarhagul. We see messengers who are linked to the great ones somehow, displayed as lamp holders in the lower area of Yarnum. And we find images of Rom in the Altar of Mercy, as well as other alien-esque creatures in the Grand Cathedral. The upper ranks of the church, who are more knowledgeable on the Great Ones, especially the choir, surely know that this is a simplification of the facts, and that they are simply great and cosmic beings. However, revering them as gods is surely a useful method of control, and a way to hide, their, hide the truth. As we progress through the game, we learn more and more that the church used their power to experiment both in blood and other eldritch techniques to attain a higher purpose. We know that the church hold on to the legitimacy by using healing blood. Uh, the blood of Attila tells us that such nuns as herself were groomed to be providers of blood for the masses. However, we know the church used blood in order to experiment as well. For the, church, the white church attire tells us, These doctors are superiors to the black preventative hunters, 
and they specialise in experimentally backed blood ministration and the scourge of the beast. They believe that medicine is not a means of treatment, but rather a method for research, and that some knowledge can only be obtained by exposing oneself to sickness. And there we have it. Uh, the church know that the blood uh, is bad, but they believe that it's worth exposing, not them, probably not themselves, but the masses to sickness. Um, but they continue to administer it in order to progress. Uh, it also shows us that the blood and the scourge are linked. Why would the church use blood to experiment? Well, aside from using blood to heal, heal and gain strength, the answer can be found in the communion ring, which say, states, This represents the healing church and its ministers. Blood ministration, of course, is the pursuit of communion. Interesting to me is the fact that it says, of course, which presupposes an amount of knowledge on the behalf of the reader, uh, because we actually get very little uh, information about the nature of blood, apart from kind of waffly statements. However, it does again reinforce that there's a link between the old blood from the labyrinth and the Eldritch truth. Anyway, it seems to be that the church is using the blood as a means to communicate with the cosmos. The Black Hunter garb suggests that the church controls people through fear. Fear of the Beast Plague, another useful side effect of blood ministration, which allows the, char the church to hold on to its power. It's this overuse and experimentation of blood which has no doubt led to the prolonging of the plague, and they are no doubt aware of this, which is the need for church, rival, uh, church hunters in the first place. The sword hunter badge tells us that clerics turned into the worst of beasts, and we see this firsthand uh, in our journey when we face the cleric beast and Vicar Amelia. And the, probably, the reason that they probably turn into the worst uh, beast is probably because of their proximity and use of blood ministration and all associated experiments. The church would eventually evolve and two upper echelons would arise, and this is the choir and the school of Mensis. We learn this from the upper, ward, upper cathedral ward key. I could go on about the lore of these two for hours and no doubt I will do a video dedicated to the church and the choir and Mensis. However, I'll just highlight their main details and the relevance to the overall plot. Uh, the choir attire tells us that they are scholars who continue the work that was begun at Bergenworth, looking at the cosmos together with the Left Behind Great One. This Left Behind Great One is Ibritas, or Ibritheus, however you want to pronounce it, uh, a daughter of the cosmos who resides in the Altar of Despair in the Upper Cathedral Ward. It isn't clear whether she willingly works with the choir or if she is their prisoner. It doesn't matter really, because either way she has been left behind. Um, I.e. she can't return to the cosmos, hence the name of the Altar of Despair. And she almost looks kind of sad when we find her. I believe she probably is working with them, uh, since we know that the nature of the most of the Great Ones is to help people. Uh, we see this from the Moon Rune, which states... The great ones that inhabit the nightmare are sympathetic in spirit, and often answer when called upon. However, I will discuss the great ones in a later video, but suffice to say the choir follow the work of Bergenworth, i.e. lining one's mind with eyes and looking to the cosmos to gain greater power. The fact they occlude their eyes with their mask is an ode to their provost, for they, he does the same. And it's probably probably to focus one's attention to the inside eyes, rather than being distracted by normal human eyes. I mean, this is what I take from it. It also is possible, there's a theory that I've read on Reddit, that people go blind when they spend too much time dabbling in the arcane. Uh, but that's, again, just speculation. The second and more important to the main story sect of the church is the School of Mentis, and they rule over Yarhagul. I mentioned the etymology of the word mensis before, and I'm sorry if I'm going into this in almost a scholarly detail, but I believe that to get the full story out of this uh, game you have to, because uh, Miyazaki-san is a, a very intelligent man, and he expects you to read into these things. The school of mensis are central to the story. Uh, they are the ones who are attempting to lure the Great Ones and beckon the moon close, which is why this is such a long night. We find a note in Yarhargul which states, 
Mad men toil surreptitiously, surreptitiously in rituals to beckon the moon, uncover their secrets. Uh, surreptitiously means um, secretively, um, quietly behind closed doors type thing. So they're secret rituals essentially. Uh, German and others link the length of the night to the proximity of the moon, which has been brought close, and so Mensis is responsible for this unusually long night and the insanity that it brings. Uh, when the moon gets so close, the, the blood moon, or whatever you want to call it, at the end of the game, um, your survivors all essentially go mad um, because of the proximity of the moon. When we enter Yarhagul for the first time, we are brought here by a burly kidnapper, and in the cells we find many other unconscious people and hunters. When we come back the second time, uh, even the kidnappers are dead, and instead we find constructs like the cramped casket and a variation of the scourge beast which seems to be made of different people. Uh, the role of the kidnapper, therefore, is to bring people for these experiments, constructs, uh, that they are making through rituals. Despite the fact that they work for the church, the school has no qualms with kidnapping people in the ward, people in Yarnum, and even their own people, including one of their own nuns, Adela. Uh, when we return, the village is overrun by these constructs, and we find people fused to the wall, as if they attempted to flee some nightmarish ritual. It seems as though the inhabitants of Yarhagul are attempting to draw the moon close in order to call or contact the Great Ones. I believe that the One Reborn is a construct uh, used by the school to house the mind of a Great One. We see that it's kind of born from the moon, uh, much like a whim, and we know that Yar Hagul inhabitants have been experimenting with constructs such as this. We know that the Great Ones are linked to the moon, and the, wound, the, the moon looks like a whim when it births the Great One. The story draws its influences mainly from H.P. Lovecraft, who, if you've never read of it, does a type of theme called Cosmic Horror. Um, the beings in this, these stories are often beyond our, our understanding, and they find it quite difficult to corporeally form our world, sometimes, which is why they end up looking like indescribable, horrific objects. The one reborn could be a body this is my speculation now, provided by the school, to draw an old one into it, to draw the mind of an old one into it. Maybe even the final boss of the game, since it is born from the moon. This is my theory and speculation only, uh, for we're not given much information about the one reborn and the Mensis ritual at this point. The school isn't just operating in the unseen village, however, but also in a separate plane, known as the Nightmare of Mensis. The cages on their head of people who have willingly put them on their head, not as cages, are some kind of antennae, which has allowed them to connect with the cosmos, and in, they have been drawn into the nightmare of Mensis at the cost of their earthly bodies, for we find them all dead. And uh, the third of umbilical cord tells us that the stillbirth of their minds was the cost of having an audience with a great one. They seem to be drawing the moon close using a child, its cry draws the Great Ones close. A note in Yar Hagul states, Nightmare's rituals crave a newborn, find one, and silence its harrowing cry. Therefore, in order to end the ritual, you must silence the cry of the child. This ritual, uh, the one that they are undertaking, is revealed to us after defeating Rom. He seems to be some kind of guardian to these secret rites. Um, and according to a note found in Uden Chapel, this is... The, uh, this is the case, he's hiding certain rituals. This is the central pillar of the story that we come to now. We humans crave the power of the Great Ones, while they crave our relative fertility. We know that they are relatively infertile. Uh, the third of umbilical cord that we should get from Murgle's wet nurse tells us, Every Great One loses its child, and then yearns for a surrogate. This cord granted Mensis audience with Murgle, but resulted in the stillbirth of their brains. The surrogate that they want is human, a human woman, and the cry of the baby is the child that they yearn for. And in the nightmare of Mensis, we find the school using a child, we can hear it, to call a great one. 
Once we defeat Murgle's wet nurse, who is most likely a great one, or at least kin to them, we break the ritual and silence the child's cry, thus ending the night. Our adventure doesn't end here, however. Upon returning to the dream, the workshop is aflame, most likely caused by Gurman. He awaits us at the great tree, amongst the graves of past hunters, and it looks like he would have us join them. He claims to offer us mercy. By killing us here, we are severed from the dream, and we are allowed to awaken under the sun of the day which is breaking over Yarnum. However, if we have seen enough of the cosmos and lined our brains enough with eyes, represented by getting three umbilical cords, we know there's more going on here, and so if we want to learn more, we must refuse. In the old workshop, we find the doll and realise that this is the source of the hunter's dream. In this old workshop, we found a third of umbilical cord whose unique description tells us the third umbilical cord precipitated the encounter with the pale moon, which beckoned the hunters and conceived the hunter's dream. The whole time we have been seeking pale blood, and here we find evidence that the hunters have a link to the cosmos, for the hunter's dream was born of an encounter with the pale moon. We find the umbilical cord on an altar, and therefore it is most likely some religious act. Some may believe we are under the guidance of the church, but we've foiled the plans of the church. The school of Mensis is the church, so clearly th this isn't the case. We find that Garmin isn't as feeble as he first appears. He is the guardian of the dream. His uh, physical appearance is probably just symbolic of the fact that he's bound to the dream, but when he's needed, he can return to full strength. The school of Mensis also wanted an encounter with a particular great one. We know this from a series of notes found in the lecture theatre. It reads, The nameless moon presence beckoned by, Lor beckoned by Lawrence and his associates, Paleblood. This is the only mention of the final boss beside the actual fight, and we encounter him when we have got the three umbilical cords. Much like German did, we encounter the moon presence. If we don't have the requirements, then we find out what happens to Gurman. We are reduced to a wheelchair and become the new guardian. Therefore, the birth of the hunter's dream was clearly a result of Gurman meeting the presence and then being made guardian to watch over it and guide future hunters. The note also suggests that the moon presence is the source of pale blood or a source of pale blood and what this, this is what the school was looking for. I postulate that this is what Mikolash calls cause or cosm the unnamed moon present. This returns us to the first note we get at the beginning of the game. Seek pale blood to transcend the hunt. Pale blood is clearly the blood of a great one. If we kill the moon presence ourselves, we find our pale blood. We transcend the hunt by becoming a newborn great one, and this has been our aim the whole time. But this calls into question, who is behind the hunter's dream, and therefore the true hunters? Gurman? The doll? The wheelchair man at the beginning, the messengers, they all drive and direct you. But who made German the guardian, and who called forth the dream? The great one, the great one we face at the end. But why? This is a little difficult to answer, uh, possibly to control the destiny of men, to stop the ritual of Mensis? Who knows? But it's possibly import it's important to note that the direction we get on our quests comes from this dreams. We all think that the School of Mensis is so clever using the Great One's weakness, but perhaps the Great Ones are more clever than we even could possibly imagine. But by defeating the Moon Presence, we outwit our Master and take his place. These conclusions are my own speculations, but I find it difficult to find any, any other explanation as to who controls the dream and what forces are behind it. So that's the, this overview video, guys. Um, it ran on very long. <laughs> I looked, uh, looked into it in quite a lot of detail, but I thought that this is the detail you need to get a good sense of the plot, as I see it. Uh, next time I will either do a video on the Great Ones themselves or the church. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this. Feel free to critique my, my view, because it is just of my view at the end of the day. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed it, and you'll join me next time. Thank you guys, please comment.